I don't know if any of you are like me, but sometimes when I turn on the television news, I wish I hadn't. It is just so full of depressing, negative stories, whether it's the national news or whether it's the local news. It's like, you know, the word news represents north, east, west, and south, and it's supposed to be whatever is new in the north, east, west, or south. But I guess all that is new is people getting shot, robbed, or or something that's negative and a disaster. And I thought, if I had a news program, I'd like to do just something. I wish some news program would do just 30 seconds or a minute of something to sort of make people smile. And I thought, so let's just pretend here for a moment we are the Gulf Coast Church of Christ uh, news station. And I'm your anchor tonight. So uh, here's the way I'm going to start the news tonight. A local man fell into an upholstery machine but doctors report that he is fully recovered. Hey, if you didn't get that, don't blame it on me. That's all on you if you didn't get that. Yesterday, a grand piano fell down a mine shaft. The resulting tune was a flat minor. Oh, that's even better if you didn't get that. All right, let's see if you get this. In Washington, a joint committee has been appointed to study marijuana use. You're just hopeless. You're no good at all. And I probably better keep my day job. So, the best place to find good news of all is in the Bible. Now, Before we read tonight's text, let me explain the context and say a word about the end of what we discussed last week. There were people in the church in Corinth who claimed that Paul had lied to them about coming to visit. He had said, I want to come visit you again uh, after he had written the first letter, and, and, or in the first letter, he said, I want to come visit you again. And then he had not because God redirected his steps, and they thought he had lied to them, and they were upset about it, and they were saying that Paul couldn't be trusted anymore. And this misunderstanding had escalated into a full-blown conflict in the church. People taking Paul's side, probably from the reading it, more people taking the other side. And we can infer that Paul must have written some pretty harsh words then in a letter that we, from what we're going to read tonight, you'll see over in chapter 2, we can infer pretty well that Paul must have written some very harsh words in a letter that we don't have access to that was not considered a part of the canon of Scripture. So that's the background of what we're going to read tonight. Now, I call upon God as my witness that I'm telling the truth. The reason I didn't return to Corinth was to spare you from a severe rebuke. But that does not mean we want to dominate you by telling you how to put your faith into practice. We want to work together with you. So you will be full of joy, for it is by your own faith that you stand firm. So I decided that I would not bring you grief with another painful visit. For if I cause you grief, who will make me glad? Certainly not someone I have grieved. Well, of course, that's just common sense. And that is why I wrote to you as I did, so that when I do come, I won't be grieved by the very ones who ought to bring me the greatest joy. Surely you all know that my joy comes from your being joyful I wrote that letter in great anguish with a troubled heart and many tears. I didn't want to grieve you, but I wanted to let you know how much love I have for you. Here's a guy who's really struggling again with this letter that apparently we have no access to, where he must have really just gone off and blasted them. And now he feels really bad about that. How many of you recognize this phrase. I want you to raise your hand if you not only recognize the phrase, but you know exactly where it come from. Why can't we all just get along? Okay, that's maybe 20 to 25% of us. Well, that 
that was a phrase spoken in 1992 by Rodney King, who was arrested and resisted the LAPD officers' attempts to subdue him, and then they just beat the living crap out of him. Except it was videoed. And it led to a trial and riots in South Los Angeles in which 53 people were killed and over a billion dollars of damage was done. And of all things, in the midst of the riots, after a court appearance, Rodney King was the one that came out and made some sense and said, can't we all just get along? He had committed a crime, but he was the one who had got beaten up nearly to the point of death, and he is the one saying, can't we all just get along? And the short answer to that question is no. I realize that's a short answer, but that's the answer. No, we can't just all get along. That's why we have laws to protect us. That's why we have to have brave men and women serving as law enforcement officers. That's why we have to have brave men and women serving in the military to defend and protect our freedoms. That's even why, that is even why we have to have shepherds, elders, overseers in the church to protect us and maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace when we cannot all get along with each other. If we all got along, wouldn't need any of those people. In our fallen, sinful, self-centered condition, we can't just all get along with others. But those of us who are disciples of Jesus Christ and are committed to the truth are supposed to be different. We're supposed to believe different. We're supposed to act different. We're supposed to live differently. And we're supposed to get along. That was Jesus' last request before he went to the cross. In his discourse to his disciples in the upper room, he said, Neither do I pray for thee alone, but for all those who shall believe on me through the word, that you all may be one, as thou art Father in me, and I am in you, that they all may be one in us. That was some of the last words that he spoke right before they left the upper room and went out, and he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. The only way we can truly get along is through the supernatural power of Jesus Christ. And just because you're a Christian doesn't automatically mean you get along with everybody else in the church. And this text proves it. There were conflicts in the church 2,000 years ago in Corinth, and there's still conflicts in the church today between Christians. So before we start talking about the world, can the world get along? We always have to look in the mirror first and ask ourselves as the church, can't we all just get along? Now some truths become obvious out of this text. The first one that became obvious to me is sometimes Christians hurt one another. The first verse we read says, the reason I didn't return to Corinth was to spare you from a severe rebuke. Even though God is my witness, I'm telling you the truth. In the church at Corinth, there were people who had caused Paul pain, and some of the things he had said or written had caused them pain as well. So we got this back and forth going on here. And it was such a sticky situation that Paul didn't want to visit at the time because he thought he would cause them more pain by coming and by visiting. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands here, but have you ever been hurt by someone in the church? If you have, join the club. Because churches are made up of imperfect people. 
We have a perfect Savior, and he will never disappoint you. But if you're expecting perfection from the brothers and sisters down the pew from you tonight, then you are setting yourself up for big disappointment because they are human. They are flesh. We all know the Bible commands us to love one another over and over and over again. Jesus called it the 11th commandment, so to speak, in John 13, 34. But that's not easy because we encounter so many unlovely people. It can be pretty difficult when we're called to love upon one another, and yet we're faced with so many unlovely people. Or as the old poem says, to live above with the saints we love. Ah, that will be glory. But to live below with the saints we know, well, uh, that's a different story. And most of us realize that has been true at some time or another in our lives. And that's why I asked you how many of you have ever been hurt by somebody in church. Or to quote that great theologian, Linus from the Peanuts cartoon, I love humanity or mankind, it's people I can't stand. We shouldn't be surprised when there's conflict in the church because the Bible's full of stories of conflict. The Bible starts with story of conflict. Cain killed Abel, his own brother, not his brother in Christ, his brother from the same mother. Joseph's brothers kidnapped him planned to kill him, and instead, at the last minute, sold him into slavery. What great guys. They didn't kill him. (laughs) I mean, the Bible is full of stories like these. The Israelites constantly griped against Moses' leadership, and several times God stepped in and had to strike some of them dead. Saul tried to kill David multiple times, chased him all over the countryside. David had an opportunity to return Saul's favor one time in the cave of Engadi, and he didn't do it. David, though, having shown great mercy that time with Saul, turned around and killed Uriah, the innocent husband of Bathsheba that he had had an affair with. The members of the early church constantly were fighting with one another. The first recorded example we have of them fighting with one another was in Acts chapter 5 when they were fighting about some of the widows being neglected by others within the church. So the list just goes on and on in our Bible. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that we would experience relationship problems. And that's why he gave us specific rules and procedures when we face a conflict. The Lord himself said this. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. And I've done that many times. Perhaps you have as well. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. That's step one of a three-step procedure that he gave us, but that's where it always should start, going to the person themselves. Now, I don't know about you, but as I read this text from the perspective of 2,000 years later, it seems petty and trivial that such a minor issue of Paul's travel plans (laughs) would cause such a big stink. But it did And I'm telling you, in my years of preaching, which is near 50 now, I can't tell you how many times I've seen churches divide over the silliest, most trivial issues. And we have been focused in this church, at least the 40 years I've been here, and I think before that, to never let that happen. To never let that happen. But we had an incident I'll tell you about back on the McGregor Boulevard campus back in the late 1980s. And um, I don't know, how many of you remember, how many of you remember that in, 
I don't think there are many of us left. But in that old building, there was a beautiful wood ceiling. How many of you remember the wood ceiling? I'm not asking if you remember what came after the wood ceiling. Keep your hands up. All right, all four or five of us there, six or eight maybe, six or eight at the most. It was beautiful, wood grain ceiling. Why anybody would ever touch it or change it, I'll never know. But a couple of people, and they were in leadership, got the harebrained idea to paint it white. They painted wood white. I'm not making it up. I'm not kidding. I was speaking at a conference in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and Steve Caldwell called me and said, when you get back, you're walking into a hornet's nest. I said, what happened? I've only been gone a couple of days. What, could I, what happened? And he said, they've painted the ceiling white, and a bunch of people are mad and upset. I said, that's it? Seriously, that's it? And he said, yeah. And I said, and he could tell you this is true, well, I'll fix that the minute I get back. That next Sunday, I could have gotten fired for this. I realize I could have. I rarely throw my weight around because I'm very aware that if I throw my weight around, it could hurt somebody. So <laughs> that's a pun, and it's okay to laugh. But I got up that Sunday morning, and before I preached or said a single word, I said this. I have heard this week about all the, the upset people and the arguments back and forth about painting the ceiling. Now, here's what I want you to understand about that. I was not in favor of painting the ceiling. I didn't get my way on this decision either. But I would rather tear the entire building down and set up folding chairs and meet outside on the property in the heat and humidity and the rain than I would to see the unity and good works of this church disrupted for one more day. And there was an ovation that broke out, and some people were a standing ovation. Do any of you who were here at the time remember that? There was an ovation that broke out, and that ended it. That ended that discussion. If a church is going to divide over painting a ceiling, God help us. That's all I know to say. The reason we have so many different churches already is simply because Christians in one group disagreed and argued, and one of them said, well, I'll just take my Bible and go somewhere else. And so another church was started, and another church was started. And sometimes Christians can act like jerks and hurt one another. True story. It was in Leadership Magazine a few years ago. There's a stretch of highway in East Alabama where a church was planted and founded called Harmony Community Church. Apparently, they wanted desperately a wonderful word like harmony to describe the loving spirit in their church. But they apparently didn't live up to their name because within five years, across the street and maybe four or five hundred yards to the south, there was New Harmony Community Church. And that must not have worked out either because down the road a couple of miles from both of them is a church called Greater New Harmony Community Church. You couldn't make that up. But it's true. And so you sometimes just want to ask, can't we all just get along? And then Paul says something else that's very important. And I've, I've titled it, church leaders shouldn't dominate other believers. And I'm using his own word. That doesn't mean we want to dominate you by telling you how to put your faith into practice. We want to work together with you so you will be full of joy, for it is by your own faith that you stand firm. One of the reasons there is conflict in churches is because we have missed out on God's plan quite often for how God wants his church organized. And many people have suffered conflict over what is a power struggle within the church. Paul was an apostle he was way ahead in God's sights of all these other people. Paul wrote over half the New Testament. 
he was way more authoritative than the people in the church at Corinth. And yet he made it clear he didn't even want to dominate them. He didn't want to be manipulative in any way. And this passage touches a very important subject, and that is the role of spiritual leaders. I know of, and I've certainly heard a lot of, some preachers, elders, other church leaders who are so dominating that they try to lead by the sheer force of their personality all the time. And their motto is, it's my way or it's trailways. That means you do what I say or you're on the next bus out of town. And there's a lot of that that happened even in the early church. But God doesn't want his church then or now to operate that way. And the dispositions of domination and intimidation have no place at all in the church. The biblical model for leadership is spiritual servant leadership. An elder in the church himself and an apostle, Peter, was the one who wrote that for us. He said, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. Peter was just expanding upon and elaborating upon what Paul said to the church at Corinth. I don't want to dominate you. I want to be your leader out of love. That's the right role model. That's a spiritual leader's job description. The role of spiritual leaders is never to dominate and control, but to lovingly lead and feed the members of the flock. Now, I gave you I gave you a bad example a moment ago of our former campus on McGregor Boulevard. Let me give you a good example now. One of the greatest things I ever saw an elder do, or or that I heard anyway, an elder personally say, happened around that same time period. It was very close to the same time period. There will be very few people that are left in this audience who will recognize the name Paul Adams, who was one of our shepherds there. If you recognize his name, raise your hand. Okay, about the same five or six. I will never forget this as long as I live because I had come here from a church where we did have some very, very authoritarian elders. And I will never forget this. When we had made the decision, or the elders had made the decision, to back then, it was an oval-shaped auditorium, but there were classrooms all across the back that were only broken up by the entrance to the building. And we had made the decision that we were growing, and we made the decision to tear out those classrooms across the back. And it increased the seating by 125 to 150 people. And so, and they'll take take Sunday school classes out of there and increase it. Well, one of our elders, Paul Adams, had been out of town for two or three weeks on vacation. And we got that work done just right like that. And I will never forget, he came in that Sunday morning, and he walked into the back, and I was standing back there, and he looked around and he said, wow, I guess we've torn out the back classrooms. I said, you didn't know about it? And he said, no, I didn't know about it, but man, this is great. The church is growing so much that we're having to tear out classrooms. That's just wonderful. I've been around some elders who would have said, they tore out them classrooms without asking me. His attitude was, I don't have to be asked about everything that happens in a building. If it's the kingdom growing, that's wonderful. What a great example. On the positive side of this text, there have been many damaging heresies that have infected the church throughout the centuries, but the false notion of a division between any human leader in the church and the people is right up there among the worst of the heresies. 
The false notion that there is a hierarchy of clergy and lay people. Some of you have been here for the 40 years that I've been here. Let me ask you, how many times have you ever heard the word clergy or lay people or laymen from this pulpit? I'll answer it for you. Never. Zilch. Nada. Because the Bible never makes that distinction. The Greek word laos, like the country, L-A-O-S, means people. And to talk about lay people is simply redundant. It's like saying people people. And I, I don't like the word clergy for preachers either. The Bible never uses the word kleros, K-L-E-R-O-S, to describe a preacher or any spiritual leader. So where did we get that heresy from? From the Roman Catholic Church until the 16th century, the only churches, hear me, until the 16th century, the only churches were the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church. In 313 AD, when the Roman Emperor Constantine Christianized Roman paganism, what he really did was paganize Christianity. And part of that process was making officers of the religious leaders, and they became officials instead of servants, like the New Testament called for servant leadership. And soon there was a bishop, and then there was a pastor of Rome, and then there was a pope, the father. So let me ask you what's worse. One pope over all the churches, like we have now, or one pope in every church? Not much difference. Neither are God's plan or God's way. And many believers have unknowingly swallowed that artificial hierarchy and think that elders, deacons, shepherds, overseers, preachers are on a different spiritual level than they are. And everybody else is down on this level. And let me tell you, we are not. There's only one level in the church of our Lord, and the ground is completely level at the foot of the cross. We embrace a beautiful doctrine known as the priesthood of all believers. It was an essential part of the early restoration movement in the 19th century. The priesthood, not of some special priest or bishop or leader, but of all believers. Sometimes it's funny the things I've been called through the years by people that come in and visit from other religious churches or beliefs or practices. Many, many times, somebody has approached me and called me Father Randy. More likely, they will call me Reverend. Now, what do I do when they do that? You stupid fool, where did you get such an idea for that? Well, that's going to convert them to a priesthood of all believers' way of thinking. I will always say, you know, I'm pretty informal and I'd just rather you call me Randy. It's, all, it's okay if you want to call me always right, Randy. That's fine too. <laughs> my wife says I'm going to get fired one day if I don't stop getting off my script. Because I've got so many places I'd like to go right now, but I'm not going to. But... Uh, no, seriously, I'll say, just call me Randy. They'll say, what do we call you? Randy? That's what the parent, that's the name my parents gave me. I don't particularly like it, but <laughs> too lazy to change it. I don't like being called Reverend. That's the official title of certain priests and monsignors and metropolitans in the Orthodox or Catholic Church. So Randy is just fine. People will ask me, what do we have our children call you? Almost all the children in this church for 40 years have called me the same thing, Mr. Randy. 
Kind of like Mr. Ed, the horse, you know? And that's fine. I neither want nor need any title at all because I really believe in the priesthood of all believers. I really believe that every member of our church is to be a minister. It's just that some of us have done it as a vocation and some of us are doing it as a volunteer. The church has only one head, and I'm not it, and the elders are not it. Jesus Christ is the only head of his church. The greatest spiritual example of leadership ever shown was when Jesus got up from the table in that upper room and threw down a towel and got on his knees and washed his disciples, the ones who every single one of them were about to betray him, Wash their feet. In an act of servant leadership. And then he said to them, as I have done unto you, so you do to others. The next thing I see in this text is that teamwork brings about joy. He said, we want to work together with you so you will be full of joy. In the NIV, he says, we're partners working alongside you, joyfully expectant. Paul was saying, I'm not your boss, I'm your partner. He said, I'm not working over you, I'm working with you. We work together as teammates on the Lord's team, and that causes us great joy. My observation over the past 50 years is that the people who are the most miserable in church are the ones who only come and sit and soak and then go home. They're like spectators. They become armchair quarterbacks. On the other hand, the people almost always who are the most joyful and excited in the church are those who have joined a ministry team. They volunteer for just about everything. They're busy serving the Lord. As the psalmist said, serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. When I was a kid, one of my favorite TV shows was The Lone Ranger. And his famous line was, Hi-ho, silver, away. That's right. It has absolutely nothing to do with the lesson, but no, the, the illustration does. What I'm about to say now doesn't, but here's a little trivia for you. What was the name of Tonto's horse? Scout, that's good. Who said that? Good. And how many bad guys did the Lone Ranger kill over the 40 years that he was on radio and television? None. He always shot the gun out of their hands. What a different world we live in now. Back to the lesson. Sometimes Christians think they can go it alone and just be a Lone Ranger Christian. I've had people say, well, I don't need to attend church. I don't need to be at church. I don't need to do anything in the church. You can be a Christian without the church. But that's impossible. Even the Lone Ranger had a team. Even the Lone Ranger had a team. He had Tonto, who called him what? And Kimosabi means what? Trusted friend. And, of course, they had Silver and Scout. Everybody needs a team. Here's a great acrostic for the word team. Together, everyone achieves more. Everyone achieves more. There are three spiritual teams you need to join. You need to be a part of a church team. You simply cannot be a Lone Ranger Christian out there by yourself. There's no biblical example of that. You won't ever find a perfect church, but you will find a perfect Jesus in that church, supporting his church as a part of the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. And that's good enough, a perfect Jesus. You need a fellowship team. That means you need people around you who care about you, who know whether you're there or not, and you know whether they're there or not, and you maybe go to lunch or to dinner or out to church after to eat or in one another's home for Bible study. You Something. 
so that you are connected to somebody else in that family of God. You need a fellowship team and you need to serve. You need to be a part of the ministry team. You need to find a job to do for Jesus and do it. Everybody needs a job to do. Everybody doesn't need to be doing every job, but everybody needs a job to do because that's what builds a family. And together, everyone achieves more, and we have more joy, this text says, and less division. And one last thing, <clears throat> with apologies to the captain and Tennille in the 70s, love will keep us together. It will. Love will keep us together. I wrote that letter, the one we don't know about, in great anguish with a troubled heart and many tears. I didn't want to grieve you, but I wanted to let you know how much love I have for you. Have you said that to anybody? Have you said to somebody, I want you to know how much love I have for you? God had broken Paul's heart over his troubled relationship with the Corinthian church. And so as he wrote to them about the pain they had caused him and he had caused them, he was moved to say, God has melted my heart with love for you. That's always the highest motivation. America is often called a melting pot. That term was first used by a Jewish playwright named Israel Zangwill, who wrote a play called The Melting Pot in 1908. People loved the play, and they thought America was a melting pot of people as well. So it was a term that became popularized. There you go. There's another word for pop. However, today, some people see America more like a salad bowl of individual group identities instead of a melting pot. We now have hyphenated citizens in America. We didn't used to have that. We now have, you know, African Americans and Hispanic Americans and Native Americans, and European Americans. However, the church remains God's true melting pot. There are and should never be no hyphenated Christians. We do not identify ourselves as Anglo-Saxon Christians or African-American Christians or Hispanic Christians. We identify ourselves together as the children of God and his heirs. And that's why Paul said to the church, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. God's love, he says here, can melt us together. I've been around a long time. I can tell you from absolute truth, the church is not wired together by organization. The church is not frozen together by formalism. The church is not locked together by any kind of structure. The church is not bound together by tradition. The church is melted together by love. I wanted to let you know how much love I have for you. Can't we all just get along? Rodney King asked. And the answer was, no, not if you're not a part of the same family, an eternal family. But if you are, if you're a part of that family, the answer can be and should be yes, because Jesus bound us together.